Yo. You may say brothers in arms. Yeah. Brothers in arms. My hair is growing. Um, we are at the end of... I always like to tell you when I'm recording this. Um, because this is already my recording for June. And this also poses for me a little bit of a challenge to post things that have been recorded previously. Um, okay, so I just want to show you around just simple things I've done now to my apartment. So this is the hanging. This is actually an African um, cloth that you use to carry children around. And it's also a reminder that I've over, already almost been a parent. Only that it wasn't me that did the act of fathering. And sometimes I feel like I want to go back to that. I've never done this indoors. Um, sometimes I feel like I want to go back to this woman because I cannot help but feel responsible in a way for the child that I have been around with during the first two months of its life and I've been the first man to hold it and I feel somewhat responsible but the problem is I believe that I never really felt attracted to the woman to the mother and that would mean you know, I already know this because I've tried. I mean, I really tried warming up to her. I really tried loving her, but it just didn't work. She was technically, when I saw her, I thought she's everything that a man could wish for. She had big round eyes. She had like like her body, her physical body seemed all right. And a lot of other men thought she was very attractive. And I could see how she would be attractive in a sense. But when I spent time with her, I never felt attracted to her, never. And that was very strange. And it was just the whole thing. And I don't know if that was then her spirit, um, because the body is also in a way the manifestation of your spirit. And there was something about her that I just, just didn't want it. And so it wasn't just that I couldn't manage to deal with the child or the situation or whatever. The point was, I just wasn't interested in her. Because I don't generally give up on something unless I really believe it's a lost cause. And that's true. Because I have managed to finish all my studies. So I'm not somebody who easily gives up. I hated studying. I like the, I go out and slack line. And I also like the, I do all kinds of other things, right? So I like the, I go out and 
throw frisbees. But what I did not like so much was the the studying because it was just so pointless. It seemed so pointless, but of course it also gave me a lot of information that shapes the way I see the world that we say we've created. Like, it's like solar panels. I mean, we say, yeah, it's like a super good way to harvest energy. But to be honest, what happens with the panels once they've been used up? It's toxic material. Now, if we say that's the best way to get energy, but you also have to look at the energy it takes to create these panels, right? So it's not just about, yeah, uh, Windcraft is really nice, because what do you do with these blades that are used for these windmills? And then you say it's green energy, but what's piggybacking on that energy? You know, how much energy does it cost to produce the windmills to harvest energy from the wind in the form of electricity? That's always what we have to see, because what we want is electricity, because it, right, it, it feeds all these devices that we use. But what's the cost to do that? Because electricity is really inefficient. And I don't know, right? I haven't really looked much into this. I do know that there are other forms to get energy. But now we use electricity and it's really inefficient. And we like to think or say it's really efficient. But have you ever walked underneath a power line that distributes electricity throughout the country? When you walk underneath these things, you can literally feel how much of the energy is being wasted and lost along the way. And that's just one fraction. That's just one position of these power lines. So imagine, I would say that you probably produce, let's say you produce, what you produce is 100%, right? The amount that's getting lost along the way is probably 40 to 60% of the electricity that is being produced, the energy that is being produced, let's say that's 100%. But what can actually be used in the form of, I turn on my laptop, I turn on the light, is probably 40 to 60%. I would say more like 40%. You know, 60% is really generous. 40% is more like, all right. So let's say half of the energy that we produce is just being lost because transporting it over long distances is basically the cost of monopoly. That's the cost of monopoly. That's the cost of giant corporations wanting to control the energy that we receive. Right? They say, we produce the energy for you. We don't want to give you the means to do it yourself. And I believe there are ways that each household could actually produce their own energy. And solar panels are certainly not it. So what would it be? Right? It's hard to say. Certainly also it isn't wood because there's not enough wood out there. So the question is, are there other ways? Like what does, what did the real Tesla talk about? You know, I'm not talking about the Tesla that Elon Musk created because that's just piggybacking on a name and then making money with that. Because the real Tesla was talking about a different kind of energy that he was just getting from the air just from because everything is energy 
Everything is already energy. And there is a way to tap into this. So, sure, if you would be a scientist and you would be looking into these things and you would make these things public, then you would have to worry about your life. So the best way to do it would be to just do it for yourself and then attest it and then to find people you trust and let them do it as well and then to just secretly spread it. But now the problem comes. People want to boast. People want to boast about things. So if you would be a scientist, you would be a scientist and you would find a way to harvest energy just from the surrounding air with no cost at all. Maybe like Nikola Tesla did. And then what would happen? Maybe you would talk to somebody about it and that guy, would, oh yeah, you know, I heard this and then he tells it to somebody else and then it goes around. Because people like to boast about other people's accomplishments because they can't keep stuff quiet, right? It's like I had this issue recently with my family. Not like, you know, I sometimes talk to my sister and I would talk to my sister and I would tell her something private about myself. I would say to her, sometimes I don't want to go, you know, sometimes I don't drink because I don't want to go to the toilet because I don't want to meet anybody. That's what I tell her. That's not non-judgmental. It's just the fact I don't drink because I don't want to leave the room because if I leave the room, then I have to meet people. And if I'm in a creative process, I don't want to meet nobody. I don't leave the house for the same reason sometimes. Because I just don't want to meet anybody. And then I hear much later from my mother that my sister told her something. But when my sister told my mother what I had said, suddenly the perspective changes a little. Because I say, it's not that I don't want to meet my mother or my father. It's just I don't want to meet anybody. If there would be other people, I also wouldn't want to meet them. But now my mo mother comes and she says that my sister told her once. It's just like something that has been casually dropped. Right, I have a conversation with my mother and suddenly she says, Yeah, uh, your sister told this to me. She said... You sometimes don't drink because you don't want to leave the room to go to the toilet because you don't want to see us. You see how it's different? I tell my sister something because I want to connect with her. You know, I want to have a casual conversation because sometimes maybe I feel lonely and I just want to talk to people. And then he, she uses the information I give her and she turns it around and makes it a dart that she can throw at my mother's heart. Because when I say to my sister, I don't drink sometimes because I don't want to leave the room, because I don't want to go to the toilet, because I don't just, I just don't want to meet anybody. My sister probably takes it personal because she thinks he doesn't want to meet me. But it's not about her. And it's not about my parents. It's that I don't want to meet anybody. And then my sister comes and takes the dart and throws it into my mother's heart. And I only hear about this much later. And that's why I get to this point where I say, why am I even talking to my sister if she just uses the information that I give her and makes darts out of it? Because if I wouldn't have told her, she couldn't have used me. But on the other hand, you could also say, if my sister does this, 
and it has an effect on my mother, that also means that my mother is really insecure. That means that I don't really have to take responsibility for what I say. Not all the time. Sometimes I just feel like saying something. But when it comes back to me, I can set it right because I know why I say things. And I know that I just mean what I mean. And I mean, I just don't want to meet anybody. It's not just this one specific person. It's just, I just don't want to meet anybody. Okay, there are people that I'm trying to avoid sometimes. Simply because they're too greedy. And that's partly also with family. They are, to me, a little bit too greedy. And sometimes you feel this greed and you just want to satisfy it and you try to give them something and then you give them something and they take it and they trample it with their feet. So if I would have just said nothing, she couldn't have used it to throw darts at my mother. So this is like a lesson because a lot of people think that family stands above everything. That to me is not really true. Sure, family is important, but if it comes to giving away information, I would say just be a little bit careful about this. Like, you shouldn't give away everything about yourself. And that's why I actually, this is interesting now, because I just had the plan to go into my living room and also film that. Now yesterday I was already filming myself in the living room and I deleted it. But I have already filmed myself in the living room. So what's the point of not doing that now, right? So I feel a little bit, I don't know what to share sometimes and what to keep private. What I want to do with this video is just to show you, I mean, some people, they have a lot of stuff in their apartments, like a lot of stuff. Like I'm telling you, this is my bed and it works perfectly. I mostly sleep on my back, but I also can sleep on my side. In the beginning, it was really uncomfortable. Now this is the best bed I could ever have. Yesterday, I carried my standing desk here the foundation, I put it into a trolley and I carried it two and a half kilometers. Yeah, I pulled it here and also my carpet and I had a great time. I liked it, but it was also a challenge because to prepare yourself to do something like this is a challenge. And I think what I would really like to do now is just to film how I work on my hangings because now I'm going to the living room because this is still it's taking shape all right and yesterday I also introduced myself to one of the neighbors and what I can say about it is that as much as I like doing these things because I feel like it's the right thing to do I also have the feeling I kind of don't like it. Like sometimes I really don't like being nice. I sometimes don't understand why I went to her to introduce myself. Because to me that's also an opener. And the more people talk to me, the less I like it. I feel like I should have probably just said nothing. And maybe it was a lesson. Because if people hide themselves in their own apartments and they get stiffer and stiffer until they just die. I mean, in a sense, isn't it just their own fault? Isn't it just their own problem? Do I have to take care of that? Well, the thing is, now I move to this house. And if I see myself as a loving being that can spread happiness, then why would I not do so? 
Because now somebody that lives in this house knows at least there's somebody who's at least a little bit friendly and who is not really hostile towards me. Just reached out to me and said, hey, I'm the new neighbor. I just wanted to introduce myself. But it's just sometimes it's a little bit too much. And that's why today I said, you see, this I also got from neighbors. Really nice. And this also, my mother bought this. This also from the neighbors. Okay, the salad has to go away. The lattice got from my mother, from my mother, from my mother. Stuff I brought here. So this will be the kitchen, but I'm not there yet. I'm working towards it because I want to build this kitchen myself. Because that's how I want it. And until then, I'll just eat, I don't know, really simple foods. Already having this carpet in here, to me, makes a real difference. So this is the hangings. And yesterday I made a video and I called it, it's a hack job. So maybe that's this video. So today I had a really interesting start. I just did a cacao ceremony, which you haven't been a part of, because I didn't want it. I read a bit in Halt's Moving Castle, which is the book I'm reading at the moment. Um, and then I ate quark with 40%. It says dry fat or something. I think it's in total it's 20%, but it's like really creamy quark. Although I don't really want to eat milk products, but for some reason, that just spoke to me and said, eat me, you're gonna like it. And it had two of these packages and I just ate the second one. Now something else I learned is that incense, while it may kind of refresh in the air, and while it may have a nice scent to it, The ventilator of my laptop constantly keeps clogging up because why? I burn incense in the same room. And that says something to you how many particles are going to be in the air. So if you if you burn incense daily, you're gonna have this in your lungs. So there comes a cost with a lot of things because this is like unfiltered stuff. And yeah, maybe this Nak Champa stuff is really good, I don't know. But I also had the experience that burning resin just left a layer of resin on top of my furniture and even my laptop. So, yeah. And now today I had this feeling, first I wanted to have this person that I remember from my life and sometimes I want to reach out, but then I remember that every time I tried that. Because the problem is, he's kind of like a, you know, he probably would have something to teach if he would open up to the teachings of his heart rather than teachings of just psychedelics. And... Maybe he did, maybe he does, maybe he will in his own time, I don't really know. And sometimes I feel kind of responsible because he was somebody who helped me a lot in my life. But I also realized that at a certain point he was just sowing doubts into my heart. 
Because as much as he tries to pretend, which is basically the only way that I can say this, pretend how happy or yeah, good he was, it was just leaking out that he actually wasn't. And so if people are deliberately toxic because they think they deserve it, then I just say, then be toxic. If you think you have to be this way, then be this way. But there's a reason why I block my sister's email address. And there's a reason why I block this guy's number. Because I don't want to have you in my life. Or I already have enough problems that I have to find solutions for if I'm just on my own. I don't have to do that for you as well. Right, if you would be interested in what I have to say, you could watch one of my videos and then see if there's something in there for you. Um, I'm also getting to this point where I have created so much content, I actually don't know where to put it. Because it's just so pointless to me, if you get it. I mean, to me, it's just really pointless. Because how much more am I supposed to say? How much more am I supposed to speak about? Who would ever listen to any of that? Because it's just ridiculous how much stuff I've created. It's literally ridiculous. Um, yeah. And so now I'm working on these hangings and what I often have when I'm creative is that while I'm being creative, I really hate it. Often I hate the creative process, but only as long as I'm still in this deep learning phase. So as long as I haven't done this enough, because I've never really done patchwork, right? This is, this is patchwork. I took shirts and I cut them into pieces and now I'm assorting them so that I can make hangings for my room because I don't like this for whatever reason I don't like it like this. I want there to be hangings because sometimes I want to sit here and I only want to focus on myself and when I can look outside then I'm constantly drawn to the outside so I want to create a room where I cannot see anything that's going on. And that's my personal choice. And I can still because there's these half moon circles on top, which I will probably not cover. But that's okay. I just want this to have colors on it. Because when the sun and the light shines on it, then it's going to look nice. Which means this is a first step into a homely home. And I'm on my own. There's nobody here that can encourage me to do this. There's no woman here to spread her lovely energy. Right? This is only me. And I'm not sure if I really like this. I'm actually not even, because a part of me, I don't want anybody in here. But I do have the feeling that at some point I may invite people. But to be honest, I do not really want that. But I'll just have to see how it goes. But it's really, you have to be careful who you let into your house. Because some people, they just bring home anybody because they're basically terrified when they're alone. So they just bring home all kinds of people just because they're terrified to be alone. 
and then they end up in situations yeah sure i mean if i would invite a woman into this apartment then this woman would probably want to have sex with me i mean if the woman would be willing to come to my apartment with me i mean we're living in these kinds of days but also in general if i would ask a woman to come in here she'd probably want to have sex with me um so the only way that i would do this is if i would feel really connected and i would meet someone and there would be a good vibe between us and i would have the feeling she's honest about wanting this and she would also come forward towards me and say you know i'm interested and one thing i also still feel all the time is my desire to masturbate and i'm still uncertain if i should give in to that right it's like you know i'm sitting here right now all right if i would sit like this i would probably have it less so the question is why do i want to masturbate and i think the answer is because when i masturbate i will feel weak and i've tried it because if you feel weak then you feel like you want a woman to take care of you but that's not how it works because it's not the time anymore that you as a man can be weak and want your woman to take care of you because i'm not sick i don't need a nurse to take care of me so women want strong men that are fathers that can hold their own ground that invest their energy into the family but if you masturbate you're getting rid of the energy and now i will let carlos castaneda do the talking while i'm doing some sewing because that's what i decided and I don't know for how long. And I really also do not want to spend a lot of time worrying about my parents anymore. So I just want to worry about my own life. If you want to say it like this. So this is a Journey to Island by Carlos Castaneda. Oh, a great deal about plants, sir, I said to the old Indian in front of me. A friend of mine had just put us in contact and left the room. We had introduced ourselves to each other. The old man had told me that his name was Juan Mapus. Did your friend tell you that? He asked casually. Yes, he did. I pick plants. Or rather, they let me pick them, he said softly. We were in the waiting room of a bus depot in Arizona. I asked him in very formal Spanish if he would allow me to question him. I said, would the gentleman, caballero, permit me to ask some questions? Caballero, which is derived from the word caballo, or horse, originally meant horseman, or a nobleman on horseback. He looked at me inquisitively. I'm a horseman without a horse, 
he said with a big smile. And then he added, I've told you that my name is Juan Matus. I liked his smile. I thought that, obviously, he was a man that could appreciate directness, and I decided to boldly tackle him with a request. I told him I was interested in collecting and studying medicinal plants. I said that my special interest was the uses of the hallucinogenic cactus, peyote, which I had studied at length at the university in Los Angeles. I thought that my presentation was very serious. I was very contained and sounded perfectly credible to myself. The old man shook his head slowly, and I, encouraged by his silence, added that it would no doubt be profitable for us to get together and talk about peyote. It was at that moment that he lifted his head and looked me squarely in the eyes. It was a formidable look, yet it wasn't menacing or awesome in any way. It was a look that went through me. I became tongue-tied at once and couldn't continue with the harangues about myself. That was the end of our meeting. Yet he left on a note of hope. He said that perhaps I could visit him at his house someday. It would be difficult to assess the impact of Don Juan's look if my inventory of experience is not somehow brought to bear on the uniqueness of that event. When I began to study anthropology and thus met Don Juan, I was already an expert in getting around. I had left my home years before, and that meant in my evaluation that I was capable of taking care of myself. Whenever I was rebuffed, I could usually cajole my way in or make concessions, argue, get angry, or if nothing succeeded, I would whine or complain. In other words, there was always something I knew I could do under the circumstances, and never in my life had any human being stopped my momentum so swiftly and so definitely as Don Juan did that afternoon. But it wasn't only a matter of being silenced. There had been times when I'd been unable to say a word to my opponent because of some inherent respect I felt for him. Still, my anger or frustration was manifested in my thoughts. Don Juan's look, however, numbed me to the point that I couldn't think coherently. I became thoroughly intrigued with that stupendous look and decided to search for him. I prepared myself for six months after that first meeting, reading up on the uses of peyote among the American Indians, especially about the peyote cult of the Indians of the Plains. I became acquainted with every work available, and when I felt I was ready, I went back to Arizona. Saturday, December 17, 1960. I found his house after making long and taxing inquiries among the local Indians. It was early afternoon when I arrived and parked in front of him. I saw him sitting on a wooden milk crate. He seemed to recognize me and greeted me as I got out of my car. We exchanged social courtesies for a while, and then, in plain terms, I confessed that I'd been very devious with him the first time we'd met. I'd boasted that I knew a great deal about peyote, when in reality I knew nothing about it. He stared at me. His eyes were very kind. I told him that for six months I'd been reading to prepare myself for our meeting, and that this time I really knew a great deal more. He laughed. Obviously, there was something in my statement which was funny to him. He was laughing at me, and I felt a bit confused and offended. He apparently noticed my discomfort and assured me that although I had had good intentions, there was really no way to prepare myself for our meeting. I wondered if it would have been proper to ask whether that statement had any hidden meaning, but I didn't. Yet he seemed to be attuned to my feelings and proceeded to explain what he had meant. He said that my endeavors reminded him of a story about some people a certain king had persecuted and killed once upon a time. He said that in the story, the persecuted people were indistinguishable from their persecutors, 
except that they insisted on pronouncing certain words in a peculiar manner proper only to them. That flaw, of course, was the giveaway. The king posted roadblocks at critical points where an official would ask every man passing by to pronounce a key word. Those who could pronounce it the way the king pronounced it would live, but those who couldn't were immediately put to death. The point of the story was that one day a young man decided to prepare himself for passing the roadblock by learning to pronounce the test word just as the king liked it. Don Juan said with a broad smile that in fact it took the young man six months to master such a pronunciation. And then came the day of the great test. The young man very confidently came upon the roadblock and waited for the official to ask him to pronounce the word. At that point, Don Juan very dramatically stopped his recounting and looked at me. His pause was very studied and seemed a bit corny to me. But I played along. I'd heard the theme of the story before. It had to do with Jews in Germany and the way one could tell who was a Jew by the way they pronounced certain words. I also knew the punchline. The young man was going to get caught because the official had forgotten the key word and asked him to pronounce another word, which was very similar, but which the young man had not learned to say correctly. Don Juan seemed to be waiting for me to ask what happened, so I did. What happened to him? I asked, trying to sound naive and interested in the story. The young man, who was truly foxy, he said, realized that the official had forgotten the key word. And before the man could say anything else, he confessed that he had prepared himself for six months. He made another pause and looked at me with a mischievous glint in his eyes. This time, he had turned the tables on me. The young man's confession was a new element, and I no longer knew how the story would end. Well, what happened then? I asked, truly interested. The young man was killed instantly, of course, he said, and broke into a roaring laughter. I liked very much the way he'd entrapped my interest. Above all, I liked the way he had linked that story to my own case. In fact, he seemed to have constructed it to fit me. He was making fun of me in a very subtle and artistic manner. I laughed with him. Afterwards, I told him that no matter how stupid I sounded, I was really interested in learning something about plants. I like to walk a great deal, he said. I thought he was deliberately changing the topic of conversation to avoid answering me. I didn't want to antagonize him with my insistence. He asked me if I wanted to go with him on a short hike in the desert. I eagerly told him that I would love to walk in the desert. This is no picnic, he said in a tone of warning. I told him that I wanted very seriously to work with him. I said that I needed information, any kind of information, on the uses of medicinal herbs, and that I was willing to pay him for his time and effort. You'll be working for me, I said, and I'll pay you wages. How much would you pay me? He asked. I detected a note of greed in his voice. Whatever you think is appropriate, I said. Pay me for my time with your time, he said. I thought he was a most peculiar fellow. I told him I didn't understand what he meant. He replied that there was nothing to say about plants. Thus, to take my money would be unthinkable for him. He looked at me piercingly. What are you doing in your pocket? He asked, frowning. Are you playing with your wanger? He was referring to my taking notes on a minute pad inside the enormous pockets of my windbreaker. When I told him what I was doing, he laughed heartily. I said that I didn't want to disturb him by writing in front of him. If you want to write, write, he said. You don't disturb me. We hiked in the surrounding desert until it was almost dark. 
He didn't show me any plans, nor did he talk about them at all. We stopped for a moment to rest by some large bushes. Plants are very peculiar things, he said, without looking at me. They are alive, and they feel. At the very moment he made that statement, a strong gust of wind shook the desert chaparral around us. The bushes made a rattling noise. Do you hear that? He asked me, putting his right hand to his ear as if he were aiding his hearing. The leaves and the wind are agreeing with me. I laughed. The friend who had put us in contact had already told me to watch out because the old man was very eccentric. I thought the agreement with the leaves was one of his eccentricities. We walked for a while longer, but he still didn't show me any plants, nor did he pick any of them. He simply breezed through the bushes, touching them gently. Then he came to a halt and sat down on a rock and told me to rest and look around. I insisted on talking. Once more, I let him know that I wanted very much to learn about plants, especially peyote. I pleaded with him to become my informant in exchange for some sort of monetary reward. You don't have to pay me, he said. You can ask me anything you want. I'll tell you what I know, and then I'll tell you what to do with it. He asked me if I agreed with the arrangement. I was delighted. Then he added a cryptic statement. Perhaps there's nothing to learn about plants, because there's nothing to say about them. I didn't understand what he'd said, or what he'd meant by it. What did you say? I asked. He repeated the statement three times, and then the whole area was shaken by the roar of an Air Force jet flying low. There, the world has just agreed with me, he said, putting his left hand to his ear. I found him very amusing. His laughter was contagious. Are you from Arizona, Don Juan? I asked, in an effort to keep the conversation centered around his being my informant. He looked at me and nodded affirmatively. His eyes seemed to be tired. I could see the white underneath his pupils. Were you born in this locality? He nodded his head again without answering me. It seemed to be an affirmative gesture, but it also seemed to be the nervous head shake of a person who's thinking. And where are you from, yourself? He asked. I come from South America, I said. That's a big place. Do you come from all of it? His eyes were piercing again as he looked at me. I began to explain the circumstances of my birth, but he interrupted me. We're alike in this respect, he said. I live here now, but I'm really a Yaqui from Sonora. Is that so? I myself come from... He didn't let me finish. I know, I know, he said. You are who you are from wherever you are as I am a Yaki from Sonora. His eyes were very shiny, and his laughter was strangely unsettling. He made me feel as if he'd caught me in a lie. I experienced a peculiar sensation of guilt. I had the feeling he knew something I didn't know or didn't want to tell. My strange embarrassment grew. He must have noticed it, for he stood up and asked me if I wanted to go eat in a restaurant in town. Walking back to his home and then driving into town made me feel better, but I wasn't quite relaxed. I somehow felt threatened, although I couldn't pinpoint the reason. I wanted to buy him some beer in the restaurant. He said that he never drank, not even beer. I laughed to myself. I didn't believe him. The friend who had put us in contact had told me that the old man was plastered out of his mind most of the time. I really didn't mind if he was lying to me about not drinking. I liked him. There was something very soothing about his person. I must have had a look of doubt on my face, 
For he then went on to explain that he used to drink in his youth, but that one day he simply dropped it. People hardly ever realize that we can cut anything from our lives, anytime, just like that. He snapped his finger. Do you think that one can stop smoking or drinking that easily? I asked. Sure, he said with great conviction. Smoking and drinking are nothing, nothing at all, if we want to drop them. At that very moment, the water that was boiling in the coffee percolator made a loud perking sound. Hear that? Don Juan exclaimed with a shine in his eyes. The boiling water agrees with me. Then he added after a pause, a man can get agreements from everything around him. At that crucial instant, the coffee percolator made a truly obscene gurgling sound. He looked at the percolator and softly said, thank you, nodded his head, and then broke into a roaring laughter. I was taken aback. His laughter was a bit too loud, but I was genuinely amused by it all. My first real session with my informant ended then. He said goodbye at the door of the restaurant. I told him I had to visit some friends and that I would like to see him again at the end of the following week. When will you be home? I asked. He scrutinized me. Whenever you come, he replied. I don't know exactly when I can come. Just come then, and don't worry. What if you're not in? I'll be there, he said, smiling, and walked away. I ran after him and asked him if he would mind my bringing a camera with me to take pictures of him in his house. That's out of the question, he said with a frown. How about a tape recorder? Would you mind that? I'm afraid there's no possibility of that either. I became annoyed and began to fret. I said I saw no logical reason for his refusal. Don Juan shook his head negatively. Forget it, he said forcefully, and if you still want to see me, don't ever mention it again. I staged a weak final complaint. I said that pictures and recordings were indispensable to my work. He said that there was only one thing which was indispensable for anything we did. He called it the spirit. One can't do without the spirit, he said, and you don't have it. Worry about that and not about the picture. What do you... He interrupted me with a movement of his hand and walked backwards a few steps. Be sure to come back, he said softly and waved goodbye. Two, erasing personal history. Thursday, December 22nd, 1960. Don Juan was sitting on the floor by the door of his house with his back against the wall. He turned over a wooden milk crate and asked me to sit down and make myself at home. I offered him some cigarettes. I had brought a carton of them. He said he didn't smoke, but he accepted the gift. We talked about the coldness of the desert nights and other ordinary topics of conversation. I asked him if I was interfering with his normal routine. He looked at me with a sort of frown and said he had no routines and that I could stay with him all afternoon if I wanted to. I prepared some genealogy and kinship charts that I wanted to fill out with his help. I'd also compiled from the ethnographic literature a long list of culture traits that were purported to belong to the Indians of the area. I wanted to go through the list with him and mark all the items that were familiar to him. I began with the kinship chart. What did you call your father? I asked. I called him dad, he said with a very serious face. I felt a little bit annoyed but I proceeded on the assumption that he hadn't understood. I showed him the chart and explained that one space was for the father and another space was for the mother. I gave as an example the different words used in English and in Spanish for father and mother. I thought that perhaps I should have taken mother first. What did you call your mother? I asked. I called her mom. He replied in a naive tone. 
I mean, what other words did you use to call your father and mother? How did you call them? I said, trying to be patient and polite. He scratched his head and looked at me with a stupid expression. Golly, he said, you got me there. Let me think. After a moment's hesitation, he seemed to remember something, and I got ready to write. Well, he said, as if he were involved in serious thought. How else did I call them? I called them... Hey, hey, Dad! Hey, hey, Mom! I laughed against my desire. His expression was truly comical, and at that moment I didn't know whether he was a preposterous old man pulling my leg or whether he was really a simpleton. Using all the patience I had, I explained to him that these were very serious questions and that it was very important for my work to fill out the forms. I tried to make him understand the idea of a genealogy and personal history. What were the names of your father and mother? I asked. He looked at me with clear, kind eyes. Don't waste your time with that crap, he said softly, but with unsuspected force. I didn't know what to say. It was as if someone else had uttered those words. A moment before, he had been a fumbling, stupid Indian, scratching his head. And then, in an instant, he'd reversed the roles. I was the stupid one, and he was staring at me with an indescribable look that wasn't a look of arrogance or defiance or hatred or contempt. His eyes were kind and clear and penetrating. I don't have any personal history, he said after a long pause. One day, I found out that personal history was no longer necessary for me. And like drinking, I dropped it. I didn't quite understand what he meant by that. I suddenly felt ill at ease, threatened. I reminded him that he'd assured me that it was all right to ask him questions. He reiterated that he didn't mind at all. I don't have personal history anymore, he said, and looked at me probingly. I dropped it one day when I felt it was no longer necessary. I stared at him, trying to detect the hidden meanings of his words. How can one drop one's personal history? I asked in an argumentative mood. One must first have the desire to drop it, he said, and then one must proceed harmoniously to chop it off, little by little. Why should anyone have such a desire? I exclaimed. I had a terribly strong attachment to my personal history. My family roots were deep. I honestly felt that without them, my life had no continuity or purpose. Perhaps you should tell me what you mean by dropping one's personal history, I said. To do away with it, that's what I mean, he replied cuttingly. I insisted that I mustn't have understood the proposition. Take you, for instance, I said. You are a yaki. You can't change that. Am I? He asked, smiling. How do you know that? True, I said. I can't know that with certainty at this point, but you know it. And that's what counts. That's what makes it personal history. I felt I'd driven a hard nail in. The fact that I know whether I'm a yaki or not doesn't make it personal history, he replied. Only when someone else knows that does it become personal history, and I assure you that no one will ever know that for sure. I'd written down what he'd said in a clumsy way. I stopped writing and looked at him. I couldn't figure him out. I mentally ran through my impressions of him. The mysterious and unprecedented way he'd looked at me during our first meeting. The charm with which he'd claimed that he received agreement from everything around him. His annoying humor and his alertness. His look of bona fide stupidity when I asked about his father and mother. 
and then the unsuspected force of his statements which had snapped me apart. You don't know what I am, do you? He said, as if he were reading my thoughts. You will never know who or what I am, because I don't have a personal history. He asked me if I had a father. I told him I did. He said that my father was an example of what he had in mind. He urged me to remember what my father thought of me. Your father knows everything about you, he said. So he has you all figured out. He knows who you are and what you do, and there's no power on earth that can make him change his mind about you. Don Juan said that everybody that knew me had an idea about me, and that I kept feeding the idea with everything I did. Don't you see? He asked dramatically. You must renew your personal history by telling your parents, your relatives, and your friends everything you do. On the other hand, if you have no personal history, no explanations are needed. Nobody is angry or disillusioned with your acts. And above all, no one pins you down with their thoughts. Suddenly, the idea became clear in my mind. I'd almost known it myself, but I'd never examined it. Not having personal history was indeed an appealing concept, at least on the intellectual level. It gave me, however, a sense of loneliness, which I found threatening and distasteful. I wanted to discuss my feelings with him, but I kept myself in check. Something was terribly incongruous in the situation at hand. I felt ridiculous trying to get into a philosophical argument with an old Indian who obviously didn't have the sophistication of a university student. Somehow, he had led me away from my original intention of asking him about his genealogy. I don't know how we ended up talking about this when all I wanted was some names for my charts, I said, trying to steer the conversation back to the topic I wanted. It's terribly simple, he said. The way we ended up talking about it was because I said that to ask questions about one's past is a bunch of crap. His tone was firm. I felt there was no way to make him budge, so I changed my tactics. Is this idea of not having personal history something that the Yaquis do? I asked. It's something that I do. Where did you learn it? I learned it during the course of my life. Did your father teach you that? No. Let's say that I learned it by myself, and now I'm going to give you its secret so you won't go away empty-handed today. He lowered his voice to a dramatic whisper. I laughed at his histrionics. I had to admit that he was stupendous at that. The thought crossed my mind that I was in the presence of a born actor. Write it down he said patronizingly. Why not? You seem to be more comfortable writing. I looked at him, and my eyes must have betrayed my confusion. He slapped his thighs and laughed with great delight. It's best to erase all personal history, he said slowly, as if giving me time to write it down in my clumsy way, because that would make us free from the encumbering thoughts of other people. I couldn't believe that he was actually saying that. I had a very confusing moment. He must have read in my face my inner turmoil and used it immediately. Take yourself, for instance, he went on saying. Right now, you don't know whether you're coming or going. And that is so because I have erased my personal history. I have little by little created a fog around me and my life. And now, nobody knows for sure who I am or what I do. But you yourself know who you are, don't you? I interjected. You bet I don't, he exclaimed, 
and rolled on the floor, laughing at my surprised look. He paused long enough to make me believe that he was going to say that he did know, as I was anticipating it. His subterfuge was very threatening to me. I actually became afraid. That is the little secret I'm going to give you today, he said in a low voice. Nobody knows my personal history. Nobody knows who I am or what I do. Not even I. He squinted his eye. He wasn't looking at me, but beyond me, over my right shoulder. He was sitting cross-legged. His back was straight, and yet he seemed to be so relaxed. At that moment, he was the very picture of fierceness. I fancied him to be an Indian chief, a red-skinned warrior in the romantic frontier sagas of my childhood. My romanticism carried me away, and the most insidious feeling of ambivalence enveloped me. I could sincerely say that I liked him a great deal, and in the same breath, I could say that I was deadly afraid of him. He maintained that strange stare for a long moment. How can I know who I am when I am all this? He said, sweeping the surroundings with a gesture of his head. Then he glanced at me and smiled. Little by little, you must create a fog around yourself. You must erase everything around you until nothing can be taken for granted, until nothing is any longer for sure or real. Your problem now is that you're too real. Your endeavors are too real. Your moods are too real. Don't take things so for granted. You must begin to erase yourself. What for? I asked belligerently. It became clear to me then that he was prescribing behavior for me. All my life, I'd reached a breaking point when someone attempted to tell me what to do. The mere thought of being told what to do put me immediately on the defensive. You said that you wanted to learn about plants, he said calmly. Do you want to get something for nothing? What do you think this is? We agreed that you would ask me questions and I'd tell you what I know. If you don't like it, there's nothing else we can say to each other. His terrible directness made me feel peeved and begrudgingly, I conceded that he was right. Let's put it this way then, he went on. If you want to learn about plants, since there's really nothing to say about them, you must, among other things, Erase your personal history. How? I asked. Begin with simple things, such as not revealing what you really do. Then you must leave everyone who knows you well. This way, you'll build up a fog around yourself. But that's absurd, I protested. Why shouldn't people know me? What's wrong with that? What's wrong is that once they know you, you're an affair, take it for granted. And from that moment on, you won't be able to break the tie of their thoughts. I personally like the ultimate freedom of being unknown. No one knows me with steadfast certainty, the way people know you, for instance. But that would be lying. I'm not concerned with lies or truths, he said severely. Lies are lies only if you have personal history. I argued that I didn't like to deliberately mystify people or mislead them. His reply was that I misled everybody anyway. The old man had touched a sore spot in my life. I didn't pause to ask him what he meant by that or how he knew that I mystified people all the time. I simply reacted to his statement defending myself by means of an explanation. I said that I was painfully aware that my family and friends believed I was unreliable, when in reality, I had never told a lie in my life. You always knew how to lie, he said. The only thing that was missing was that you didn't know why to do it. Now you do. 
I protested. Don't you see that I'm really sick and tired of people thinking that I'm unreliable? I said. But you are unreliable, he replied with conviction. Damn it to hell, man, I am not, I exclaimed. My mood, instead of forcing him into seriousness, made him laugh, hysteric. I really despised the old man for all his cockiness. Unfortunately, he was right about me. After a while, I calmed down, and he continued talking. When one doesn't have personal history, he explained, nothing that one says can be taken for a lie. Your trouble is that you have to explain everything to everybody, compulsively. And at the same time, you want to keep the freshness, the newness of what you do. Well, since you can't be excited after explaining everything you've done, you lie in order to keep on going. I was truly bewildered by the scope of our conversation. I wrote down all the details of our exchange in the best way I could, concentrating on what he was saying, rather than pausing to deliberate on my prejudices or on his meaning. From now on, he said, you must simply show people whatever you care to show them, but without ever telling exactly how you've done it. I can't keep secrets, I exclaimed. What you're saying is useless to me. Then change, he said cuttingly and with a fierce glint in his eyes. He looked like a strange, wild animal, and yet he was so coherent in his thoughts and so verbal. My annoyance gave way to a state of irritating confusion. You see, he went on, we only have two alternatives. We either take everything for sure and real, or we don't. If we follow the first, we end up bored to death with ourselves and with the world. If we follow the second and erase personal history, we create a fog around us, a very exciting and mysterious state in which nobody knows where the rabbit will pop out, not even ourselves. I contended that erasing personal history would only increase our sensation of insecurity. When nothing is for sure, we remain alert, perennially on our toes, he said. It's more exciting not to know which bush the rabbit is hiding behind than to behave as though we know everything. He didn't say another word for a very long time. Perhaps an hour went by. In complete silence. I didn't know what to ask. Finally he got up and asked me to drive him to the nearby town. I didn't know why, but our conversation had drained me. I felt like going to sleep. He asked me to stop on the way and told me that if I wanted to relax, I had to climb to the flat top of a small hill on the side of the road and lie down on my stomach with my head towards the east. He seemed to have a feeling of urgency. I didn't want to argue, or perhaps I was too tired to even speak. I climbed the hill and did as he had prescribed. I slept only two or three minutes, but it was sufficient to have my energy renewed. We drove to the center of town, where he told me to let him off. Come back, he said as he stepped out of the car. Be sure to come back. Three, losing self-importance. I had the opportunity of discussing my two previous visits to Don Juan with the friend who had put us in contact. It was his opinion that I was wasting my time. I related to him in every detail the scope of our conversation. He thought I was exaggerating and romanticizing a silly old fogey. There was very little room in me for romanticizing such a preposterous old man. I sincerely felt that his criticism about my personality had seriously undermined my liking him. Yet I had to admit that they had always been apropos, sharply delineated, and true to the letter. 
The crux of my dilemma at that point was my unwillingness to accept that Don Juan was very capable of disrupting all my preconceptions about the world, and my unwillingness to agree with my friend, who believed that the old Indian was just nuts. I felt compelled to pay him another visit before I made up my mind. Wednesday, December 28, 1960. Immediately after I arrived at his house, he took me for a walk in the desert chaparral. He didn't even look at the bag of groceries that I brought him. He seemed to have been waiting for me. We walked for hours. He didn't collect or show me any plants. He did, however, teach me an appropriate form of walking. He said that I had to curl my fingers gently as I walked so I would keep my attention on the trail and the surroundings. He claimed that my ordinary way of walking was debilitating and that one should never carry anything in the hands. If things had to be carried, one should use a knapsack or any sort of carrying net or shoulder bag. His idea was that by forcing the hands into a specific position, one was capable of greater stamina and greater awareness. I saw no point in arguing and curled my fingers as he had prescribed and kept on walking. My awareness was in no way different, nor was my stamina. We started our hike in the morning and we stopped to rest around noon. I was perspiring and tried to drink from my canteen, but he stopped me by saying that it was better to have only a sip of water. He cut some leaves from a small yellowish bush and chewed them. He gave me some and remarked that they were excellent and if I chewed them slowly, my thirst would vanish. It didn't, but I wasn't uncomfortable either. He seemed to have read my thoughts and explained that I hadn't felt the benefits of the right way of walking or the benefits of chewing the leaves because I was young and strong and my body didn't notice anything because it was a bit stupid. He laughed. I wasn't in a laughing mood and that seemed to amuse him even more. He corrected his previous statement, saying that my body wasn't really stupid, but somehow dormant. At that moment, an enormous crow flew right over us, cawing. That startled me and I began to laugh. I thought that the occasion called for laughter, but to my utter amazement, he shook my arm vigorously and hushed me up. He had a most serious expression. That wasn't a joke he said severely, as if I knew what he was talking about. I asked for an explanation. I told him that it was incongruous that my laughing at the crow had made him angry when we had laughed at the coffee percolator. What you saw was not just a crow, he exclaimed. But I saw it and it was a crow, I insisted. You saw nothing, you fool, he said in a gruff voice. His rudeness was uncalled for. I told him that I didn't like to make people angry and that perhaps it would be better if I left, since he didn't seem to be in a mood to have company. He laughed uproariously, as if I were a clown performing for him. My annoyance and embarrassment grew in proportion. You're very violent, he commented casually. You're taking yourself too seriously. But weren't you doing the same, I interjected. Taking yourself seriously when you got angry at me? He said that to get angry at me was the farthest thing from his mind. He looked at me piercingly. What you saw was not an agreement from the world, he said. Crows flying or cawing are never an agreement. That was an omen. An omen of what? A very important indication about you he replied cryptically. At that very instant, the wind blew the dry branch of a bush right to our feet. That was an agreement, he exclaimed, and looked at me with shiny eyes and broke into a belly laugh. I had the feeling that he was teasing me by making up the rules of his strange game as we went along. Thus, it was all right for him to laugh, but not for me. My annoyance mushroomed again and I told him what I thought of him. He wasn't cross or offended at all. He laughed, and his laughter caused me even more anguish and frustration. 
I thought that he was deliberately humiliating me. I decided right then that I had had my fill of field work. I stood up and said that I wanted to start walking back to his house because I had to leave for Los Angeles. Sit down, he said imperatively. You get peeved like an old lady. You can't leave now because we're not through yet. I hated him. I thought he was a contemptuous man. He began to sing an idiotic Mexican folk song. He was obviously imitating some popular singer. He elongated certain syllables and contracted others and made the song into a most farcical affair. It was so comical that I ended up laughing. You see, you laugh at the stupid song, he said. But the man who sings it that way and those who pay to listen to him aren't laughing. They think it's serious. What do you mean? I asked. I thought he'd deliberately concocted the example to tell me that I'd laughed at the crow because I hadn't taken it seriously, the same way I hadn't taken the song seriously. But he baffled me again. He said I was like the singer and the people who liked his songs, conceited and deadly serious about some nonsense that no one in his right mind should give a damn about. He then recapitulated, as if to refresh my memory, all he had said before on the topic of learning about plants. He stressed emphatically that if I really wanted to learn, I had to remodel most of my behavior. My sense of annoyance grew until I had to make a supreme effort to even take notes. You take yourself too seriously, he said slowly. You're too damn important in your own mind. That must be changed. You're so goddamn important that you feel justified to be annoyed with everything. You're so damn important that you can afford to leave if things don't go your way. I suppose you think that shows you have character. That's nonsense. You're weak and conceited. I tried to stage a protest but he didn't budge. He pointed out that in the course of my life, I hadn't ever finished anything because of that sense of disproportionate importance that I attached to myself. I was flabbergasted at the certainty with which he made his statements. They were true, of course. And that made me feel not only angry, but also threatened. Self-importance is another thing that must be dropped. Just like personal history, he said in a dramatic tone. I certainly didn't want to argue with him. It was obvious that I was at a terrible disadvantage. He wasn't going to walk back to his house until he was ready. And I didn't know the way. I had to stay with him. He made a strange and sudden movement. He sort of sniffed the air around him. His head shook slightly and rhythmically. He seemed to be in a state of unusual alertness. He turned and stared at me with a look of bewilderment and curiosity. His eyes swept up and down my body as if he were looking for something specific. Then he stood up abruptly and began to walk fast. He was almost running. I followed him. He kept a very accelerated pace for nearly an hour. Finally, he stopped by a rocky hill and we sat in the shade of a bush. The trotting had exhausted me completely, although my mood was better. It was strange, the way I had changed. I felt almost elated. But when we had started to trot after our argument, I was furious with him. This is very weird, I said, but I feel really good. I heard the cawing of a crow in the distance. He lifted his finger to his right ear and smiled. That was an omen he said. A small rock tumbled downhill and made a crashing sound when it landed in the chaparral. He laughed out loud and pointed his finger to the direction of the sound. And that was an agreement, he said. He then asked me if I was ready to talk about my self-importance. I laughed. My feeling of anger seemed so far away that I couldn't even conceive how I had become so cross with him. I can't understand what's happening to me, I said. 
I got angry, and now I don't know why I'm not angry anymore. The world around us is very mysterious, he said. It doesn't yield its secrets easily. I liked his cryptic statements. They were challenging and mysterious. I couldn't determine whether they were filled with hidden meanings or whether they were just plain nonsense. If you ever come back to the desert here, he said, stay away from that rocky hill where we stopped today. Avoid it like the plague. Why, what's the matter? This isn't the time to explain it, he said. Now, we are concerned with losing self-importance. As long as you feel that you're the most important thing in the world, you can't really appreciate the world around you. You're like a horse with blinders. All you see is yourself apart from everything else. He examined me for a moment. I'm going to talk to my little friend here, he said, pointing to a small plant. He kneeled in front of it and began to caress it and to talk to it. I didn't understand what he was saying at first, but then he switched languages and talked to the plant in Spanish. He babbled inanities for a while. Then he stood up. It doesn't matter what you say to a plant, he said. You can just as well make up words. What's important is the feeling of liking it and treating it as an equal. He explained that a man who gathers plants must apologize every time for taking them and must assure them that someday his own body will serve as food for them. So all in all, the plants and ourselves are even, he said. Neither we nor they are more or less important. Come on, talk to the little plant, he urged me. Tell it that you don't feel important anymore. I went as far as kneeling in front of the plant, but I couldn't bring myself to speak to it. I felt ridiculous and laughed. I wasn't angry, however. Don Juan patted me on the back and said that it was all right, that at least I had contained my temper. From now on, talk to the little plants. He said, talk until you lose all sense of importance. Talk to them until you can do it in front of others. Go to those hills over there and practice by yourself. I asked if it was all right to talk to the plants silently in my mind. He laughed and tapped my head. No, he said. You must talk to them in a loud and clear voice if you want them to answer you. I walked to the area in question, laughing to myself about his eccentricities. I even tried to talk to the plants, but my feeling of being ludicrous was overpowering. After what I thought was an appropriate wait, I went back to where Don Juan was. I had the certainty that he knew I hadn't talked to the plants. He didn't look at me. He signaled me to sit down by him. Watch me carefully, he said. I'm going to have a talk with my little friend. He kneeled down in front of a small plant and for a few minutes, he moved and contorted his body, talking and laughing. I thought he was out of his mind. This little plant told me to tell you that she is good to eat, he said as he got up from his kneeling position. She said that a handful of them would keep a man healthy. She also said that there's a batch of them growing over there. Don Juan pointed to an area on a hillside perhaps 200 yards away. Let's go and find out, he said. I laughed at his histrionics. I was sure we would find the plants because he was an expert in the terrain and knew where the edible and medicinal plants were. As we walked towards the area in question, he told me casually that I should take notice of the plant because it was both a food and a medicine. I asked him half in jest if the plant had just told him that. He stopped walking and examined me with an air of disbelief. He shook his head from side to side. Ah, he exclaimed, laughing. Your cleverness makes you more silly than I thought. How can the little plant tell me now what I've known all my life? 
He proceeded then to explain that he knew all along the different properties of that specific plant, and that the plant had just told him that there was a batch of them growing in the area he had pointed to, and that she didn't mind if he told me that. Upon arriving at the hillside, I found a whole cluster of the same plants. I wanted to laugh, but he didn't give me time. He wanted me to thank the batch of plants. I felt excruciatingly self-conscious and couldn't bring myself to do it. He smiled benevolently and made another of his cryptic statements. He repeated it three or four times, as if to give me time to figure out its meaning. The world around us is a mystery, he said. And men are no better than anything else. If a little plant is generous with us, we must thank her. Or perhaps she will not let us go. The way he looked at me when he said that gave me a chill. I hurriedly leaned over the plants and said, thank you, in a loud voice. He began to laugh in controlled and quiet spurts. We walked for another hour and then started on our way back to his house. At a certain time, I dropped behind and he had to wait for me. He checked my fingers to see if I had curled them. I had not. He told me imperatively that whenever I walked with him, I had to observe and copy his mannerisms or not come along at all. I can't be waiting for you as though you're a child, he said in a scolding tone. That statement sunk me into the depths of embarrassment and bewilderment. How could it be possible that such an old man could walk so much better than I? I thought I was athletic and strong, and yet he had actually had to wait for me to catch up with him. I curled my fingers, and strangely enough, I was able to keep his tremendous pace without any effort. In fact, at times, I felt that my hands were pulling me forward. I felt elated. I was quite happy walking inanely with the strange old Indian. I began to talk and asked repeatedly if he would show me some peyote plants. He looked at me, but didn't say a word. 4. Death is an advisor. Wednesday, January 25th, 1961. Would you teach me some day about peyote? I asked. He didn't answer, and as he had done before, simply looked at me as if I were crazy. I had mentioned the topic to him in casual conversation various times already, and every time he frowned and shook his head. It wasn't an affirmative or a negative gesture. It was rather a gesture of despair and disbelief. He stood up abruptly. We'd been sitting on the ground in front of his house. An almost imperceptible shake of his head was the invitation to follow him. We went into the desert chaparral in a southerly direction. He mentioned repeatedly as we walked that I had to be aware of the uselessness of my self-importance and of my personal history. Your friends, he said, turning to me abruptly. Those who have known you for a long time, you must leave them quickly. I thought he was crazy, and his insistence was idiotic, but I didn't say anything. He peered at me and began to laugh. After a long hike, we came to a halt. I was about to sit down to rest, but he told me to go some 20 yards away and talk to a batch of plants in a loud and clear voice. I felt ill at ease and apprehensive. His weird demands were more than I could bear, and I told him once more that I couldn't speak to plants because I felt ridiculous. His only comment was that my feeling of self-importance was immense. He seemed to have made a sudden decision and said that I shouldn't try to talk to plants until I felt easy and natural about it. You want to learn about it, and yet you don't want to do any work, he said accusingly. What are you trying to do? My explanation was that I wanted bona fide information about the uses of plants. Thus, I had asked him to be my informant. I'd even offered to pay him for his time and trouble. You should take the money, I said. This way we both would feel better. 
I could then ask you anything I want to because you would be working for me and I would pay you for it. What do you think of that? He looked at me contemptuously and made an obscene sound with his mouth, making his lower lip and his tongue vibrate by exhaling with great force. That's what I think of it, he said, and laughed hysterically at the look of utmost surprise that I must have had on my face. It was obvious to me that he wasn't a man I could easily contend with. In spite of his age, he was brilliant and unbelievably strong. I had had the idea that, being so old, he could have been the perfect informant for me. Old people, I had been led to believe, made the best informants because they were too feeble to do anything else except talk. Don Juan, on the other hand, was a miserable subject. I felt he was unmanageable and dangerous. The friend who had introduced us was right. He was an eccentric old Indian, and although he wasn't plastered out of his mind most of the time, as my friend had told me, he was worse yet. He was crazy. I again felt the terrible doubt and apprehension I had experienced before. I thought I had overcome that. In fact, I had had no trouble at all convincing myself that I wanted to visit him again. The idea had crept into my mind, however, that perhaps I was a bit crazy myself when I realized that I liked to be with him. His idea that my feeling of self-importance was an obstacle had really made an impact on me. But all that was apparently only an intellectual exercise on my part. The moment I was confronted with his odd behavior, I began to experience apprehension and I wanted to leave. I said that I believed we were so different that there was no possibility of our getting along. One of us has to change, he said, staring at the ground. And you know who. He began humming a Mexican folk song and then lifted his head abruptly and looked at me. His eyes were fierce and burning. I wanted to look away or close my eyes, but to my utter amazement, I couldn't break away from his gaze. He asked me to tell him what I had seen in his eyes. I said that I saw nothing, but he insisted that I had to voice what his eyes had made me feel aware of. I struggled to make him understand that the only thing his eyes made me aware of was my embarrassment and that the way he was looking at me was very discomforting. He didn't let go. He kept a steady stare. It wasn't an outright menacing or mean look. It was rather a mysterious but unpleasant gaze. He asked me if he reminded me of a bird. A bird? I exclaimed. He giggled like a child and moved his eyes away from me. Yeah, he said softly. A bird. A very funny bird. He locked his gaze on me again and commanded me to remember. He said with an extraordinary conviction that he knew I had seen that look before. My feelings of the moment were that the old man provoked me against my honest desire every time he opened his mouth. I stared back at him in obvious defiance. Instead of getting angry, he began to laugh. He slapped his thigh and yelled as if he were riding a wild horse. Then he became serious and told me that it was of utmost importance that I stop fighting him and remember that funny bird he was talking about. Look into my eyes, he said. His eyes were extraordinarily fierce. There was a feeling about them that actually reminded me of something, but I wasn't sure what it was. I pondered upon it for a moment, and then I had a sudden realization. It wasn't the shape of his eye, nor the shape of his head, but some cold fierceness in his gaze that had reminded me of the look in the eyes of a falcon. At the very moment of that realization, he was looking at me askew, and for an instant, my mind experienced a total chaos. I thought I had seen a falcon's features instead of Don Juan's. The image was too fleeting, and I was too upset to have paid more attention to it. 
In a very excited tone, I told him that I could have sworn I had seen the features of a falcon on his face. He had another attack of laughter. I have seen the look in the eyes of falcons. I used to hunt them when I was a boy. And in the opinion of my grandfather, I was good. He had a leghorn chicken farm 